Um, I am really proud to introduce today our keynote speaker, Robert Franklin, who is the assistant director at Hanford History Project. Um, I find it fascinating when he talks about some of the history of Hanford. I think most of us who didn't maybe grow up here um, don't know that history, and, and there's so many little intricate things that he knows and brings to us that is very interesting. I find it very interesting. I've heard him speak, I think, three times prior, and I always take away something new and fun, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, in the role that he plays, he is an archivist and an oral historian for the Department of Energy's Hanford Collection and Washington State University's collections on Hanford. He also borrows materials from our museum here, so I'll give them a plug as well, so that's kind of cool. You attended Washington State University, go Cougs in Pullman, <laughs> and earned a master's degree in history. Um, in graduate school, you took a graduate level seminar on Hanford Oral History Project, which sparked your interest in Hanford and impacts the Manhattan Project on the rural agricultural communities in Washington. So congratulations for being here. We're happy to listen to you. So <laughs> take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure uh, to be back, as Colin mentioned. Um, I was here four years ago, maybe five. Uh, and, and we were just starting a project to document the African-American history of Hanford and the Tri-Cities, a project that was in partnership with a couple really important entities. Does this thing work? Hello. All right, I'm gonna need you to, I'm gonna need you to advance me. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be stuck on this slide forever. It's pretty boring. All right, there we go. Um, so uh, this partnership, this project that, um, that I had just actually talked about the last time I was here and was looking for interviewees, and uh, that's a foreshadowing because we're starting another project uh, on the Latinx history of the Tri-Cities, my, my partner Bob Bauman and I, and we're also in need of, of interviewees um, for that project, but so if you, if you I'll put that out now, if you know anyone who um, knows the history of the, the Latinx history of the Tri-Cities, especially from, uh, we're looking at the oldest far, we can go back, so the 60s, 70s, 80s, or be back even further. If you know somebody that could speak to any aspect of that history, please let me know. And even better yet, you could tell them that, that, that we want to get a hold of them to make that introduction a little bit easier. But uh, this project was, uh, the, what I'm going to speak to you about, the history I'm going to speak to you about today, came, uh, came about with a partnership with the National Park Service, who is one, ha one of the two agencies that manages the Manhattan Project National Historical Park out of Hanford, and also with the ACCESS Group, the African American Community Cultural and Educational Society. Uh, and so we, we partnered with both of those agencies to, uh, to do a two-year project to, um, uh, to document that history. And in fact, I see two people that I, that I interviewed back there, Danny and Ricky, um, among many others. We, I conducted about 27 interviews myself. Um, and then with our partnership with ACCESS, the ACCESS Group had actually done oral histories with some Manhattan Project workers back in the early 2000s. And so we rescued those from their um, imprisonment on VHS uh, and digitized them, brought them into the 21st century, um, and were able to use our resources to transcribe them and get them online. But I want to say that this project would not have been possible um, without the support of, of, of course, the financial support of the um, National Park Service, but more importantly, the community support of the African American community, uh, access, and all of the people that we interviewed uh, would, would not have made this possible. So, backing up quite a bit, um, the, this, the, the story of the African American community uh, uh, in the Tri-Cities really starts with Hanford. There had been a small African American community pre-existing to Hanford. The 1940 census in Pasco shows there were 27 African American residents, um, mostly connected with the railroad industry. Um, almost all of them lived in East Pasco or at least east of 4th Street. That seemed to be the demarcating line between the white and black communities in Pasco. Uh, from its creation, really up through the end of the 1960s, mid-1970s, when urban renewal effectively 
redeveloped East Pasco and, and permanently changed that community. Um, it's so, but when, in December 22nd, 1942, Colonel Franklin Mathias takes off from the Pasco Airport on a chartered plane and is flying over the mid-Columbia. And what he's looking for is he's looking for a place to build what becomes the Hanford Engineer Works. And what he's looking for, and he's he searched eight other sites throughout the Western United States and has not found what he's looking for. But suddenly, as he kind of crests into what is now the Hanford site, the, the towns of Hanford and White Bluffs and Richland, he sees exactly what he's looking for. There's the Columbia River, a source of f pretty fast-flowing, clear, year-round water. There is a very rural population, Hanford, White Bluffs, and Richland, and the 586 square miles that become the Hanford Reservation only contain about 1,400 people, right? So that's not a lot. Of, it's the government can easily survey, those, survey that land, pay the people for their land, and, and evacuate them or evict them in a matter of months. The area also has um, a lot of sand and gravel used for construction. It has a rail line, a major rail depot in Pasco which it's going to need to bring in people and material. And it also has electricity from the Grand Coulee and Bonneville dams. More electricity than it needs. Has everything it needs. So Matthias sends his report to General Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project. I, um, FDR signs an order evicting everybody. And then immediately they set about choosing a contractor. They choose du the DuPont Corporation. Uh, DuPont had, uh, was not only a large corporation that had a lot of experience in chemical and hydroengineering, which that's primarily the story of Hanford. Um, it's primarily a story of chemical and hydroengineering in terms of processing plutonium. DuPont also has uh, experience working in very hazardous environments. It owns Remington at this time. Like I said, they make explosives, right? That's a safety conscious industry. And DuPont knows it has to hire a lot of people because they're going to have to build three reactors, three processing plants, a town of 12,000, um, and all of the ascended facilities. So they start hiring. Because DuPont's a federal contractor, they have to play by federal contracting rules. In 1939, President Roosevelt signs in the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which is, which is basically, a, 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 I guess the easy way to say it would be an early form of affirmative action said that defense contractors, or U.S. contractors, had to have a workforce that represented American taxpayers. Right? It, just affects defense, it just affects federal contractors, but it's an early start. Right? And this is often the story of civil rights in this country. The government leads, industry falls. Um, and in this case, this meant that DuPont had to hire a certain percentage of his workforce to be African American. About 10 to 15 percent is what DuPont decided would be the amount that would pass the FEPC, not get them hung up there. So immediately DuPont starts sending out agents to 48 states. They work with the War Manpower Commission looking for workers. They get a lot of workers out of the South. And like I said, so of the 120,000 hired, about 10 to 15 percent of those are African Americans. Now, they, DuPont has to build a big camp to hold all these people in. That's the Hanford Construction Camp. It's a town of about 45 to 50,000 people on the Hanford site. It exists for about 16 months. It's the fourth largest city in Washington state at that time. And the Hanford construction camp is also a segregated space. It is a space where uh, work and living arrangements are segregated by, by race as well as by gender. Uh, husbands and wives could not even live together. But blacks and whites did not work together. Um, African Americans were generally hired for menial jobs, um, construction, ditch digging, but one rare exception was concrete work. Um, that was an area of construction that African Americans had often specialized in, and so they were essential. Many, in fact, much of the concrete of the main buildings in Hanford, like the T plant and the B reactor, much of that was poured by African American laborers. Their, their work is in the DNA of the Hanford site. Now, this is a lot of people to bring to the Tri-Cities, right? Pasco and Kennewick were pretty small, areas in 1940. Um, and Pasco also has other, other things impacting its development. The Naval Air Station is in Pasco. Big Pasco, the railroad depot, and now Hanford. And so in early 1943, Pasco and Kennewick city leaders meet, and they, and I don't have a photo of that, just another basic Hanford photo. But they meet, and they, they meet uh, separately and then together with DuPont to, to try to solve what they term, and this is from the Pasco Herald quote there, Negro problem. They were worried 
that the number of African Americans coming to the city would permanently alter the character. They were worried about racial tensions. Um, in effect, this mirrored many northern communities that faced influxes of African Americans from the south during the Great Migration, the largest migration in American history, where in six decades, almost, almost six million people left the south for the north and the west. And so they meet and they, they tell DuPont, they say, you know, as, as what we'd like to see you do is we'd like to see you give every single African American here a ticket home. So when they're done working, they leave. And DuPont agrees to do this and then never follows through with it. But the Hanford construction camp was, like I mentioned, was segregated by race and by gender. Um, but they didn't, it didn't hold everyone that came to work because DuPont hired many thousands more people than they could fit in the construction camp. So many lived around um, in surrounding areas. Um, some, some who were going to work in the plant permanently lived in Richland. Uh, others lived in Kennewick and up the Yakima Valley, with the exception of African Americans who were forced to live on the east side of Pasco. Um, or if not exactly east of the railroad tracks, again, up until 4th Street. That was the barrier line. Um, really, there was very, a lot of pushback for any African American property ownership west of 4th Avenue. So why did they come? Well, jobs, money. Another thing that the Fair Employment Practices Commission mandated, besides, besides the representation of the workforce, was at least equal pay for equal work. Um, some of the folks, uh, one of the gentlemen I interviewed, Vannis Daniels, his father, Vannis Daniels Sr. and Uncle, Uncle Willie Daniels came up from Kildare, Texas uh, in 1943. And they were some of the first people here to actually build the camp that would hold the workers that were going to build the rest of the facility. And Vannis talked about how his father, who was a conductor for the Southern Pacific Railroad and had a share crop, somehow in 1942 supported 13 people on a weekly salary of $13, 12 to $13, um, in addition to his share crop. He took a job at Hanford making a dollar an hour, eight, 10 hours a day, six days a week. Now, you can do the math, right? 13 to 60. That is a, a, a transformative amount of money. And, those, and that, that war work and those good wages, and, and DuPont kind of had to pay these good wages because you know, this was not a known commodity, right? People taking jobs in LA and San Francisco and Seattle you know, might have expected some sort of amenities, <laughs> but Hanford was a hard place, right? The termination winds, the isolation, the heat, the cold in the winter. Um, so the wages were one of the things that kept people here. African Americans, as I mentioned, did work in segregated um, labor forces, but their, their foremen were also allowed to be, to be black. So there, was not, there were not whites directly in charge of groups of black. DuPont was somewhat sensitive to that, to that issue. One thing, interestingly, um, that uh, was also segregated was entertainment. Here, this is the 1944 Christmas schedule. Um, declassified because it was in a government report about Hanford. This wasn't originally classified, it's just in a government report that was later declassified. But you can see how DuPont even went, uh, you know, wanted to follow what was then expected to be de facto. Because segregation did not exist in Washington State, um, ever. Right, there, were no, there was no laws mandating segregation, but DuPont and the Army and the local communities de facto it, right? Upon the arrival of black bodies came segregation, came the expectation of segregation. But there were wrinkles to segregation. One of them was in sports. Um, baseball, of course, is America's pastime, and, uh, and it has some competition now, but in the 1940s, baseball was America's pastime, right? It was easily the most popular sport. And following the National Leagues, um, there were black and white teams at, there were all black and all white teams at Hanford, except that there were not enough African Americans to field their own league. So, and this is, I'm sorry for the quality of this picture, it's very small, but this is a photo of a game out at the Hanford site, and it's a white team playing a black team. This is not something that would have happened nationwide for many, many more years. So in this way, um, Hanford did offer interesting wrinkles to segregation, and this, and this is what we kind of see in northern communities across the United States where there, is no, where there is no legal segregation, you get de facto or de jure segregation, you see these kinds of wrinkles that happen here. Um, 
And, and it is, uh, it's also important to note that um, the, the easily, and, and this has from, come from white and black remembrances on the Hanford site, easily the best players were, were the black team, the Hanford Eagles. Um, they, were, they were quite something to see, apparently. So moving past the Manhattan Project, Hanford, it was thought, especially at the end of World War II, many in, in Richland and the surrounding area worried that Hanford would close down. Right? Of course, the world uh, had other plans, the Russians and the America had other plans, and Hanford ends up not only existing, but expanding during the Cold War. In a matter of you know, eight years, going from three reactors to eight, right? and even building bigger jumbo reactors, more separations facilities. In addition, the, the dams, which we've talked a little bit about, the dams are being put up on the Columbia. All of this means labor, concrete work, and the continued migration of African Americans, and in fact, many chose specifically to come to Pasco because of they, they had relatives here now. There was an established presence here now, and also the wages were good, and it was rural. And this is what's interesting about Pasco, is that of all of the places for, for black migration, um, Pasco and the Tri-Cities in general is a pretty rural area. Most in, the migration, most in the Great Migration migrated to urban areas, Seattle, Portland, LA, Chicago, right? Whereas Pasco is a rural area for folks to migrate to. And the numbers that come are actually staggering. Okay, so there were 27 black residents in Pasco in 1940, 1940 census. In the 1950 census, there are over 2,000 residents. 20% of Pasco is African American in 1950. That makes it the largest per capita black population in the entire Pacific Northwest, and the largest in the West Coast outside of Oakland and Watts, right? So not by numbers, but again by per capita, a very large and significant population. And in some ways, the attitudes of city leaders had started to change too. Um, now their quote, Negro problem, was just a, was, was not so much a problem of having people leave, but a problem of what to do with those that had decided to stay. Because where they were staying, East Pasco, was effectively a ghetto. East Pasco was a neighborhood that had no, most of those homes did not have running water. The city did not and act actively fought sewer connections to homes in East Pasco. Many homes did not have electricity. Um, many people were still cooking on wood stoves until the 1960s. Com compare and contrast that, of course, with the atomic community of Richland, which had had brand new alphabet homes built for it during the war and after, a city that prides itself on its kind of housing quality. Meanwhile, many workers, the people that are building these very facilities, are frankly living in shacks, right? Uh, it, it, things that should, should have been condemned, but were not because there was no other place for these people to actually live. Um, some even lived in tents, right? like actually permanent, like lived in tents for months um, upon arriving here because there was so little housing in East Pasco. Um, and housing became primarily the focus of civil rights activity in Pasco. Housing and employment. Because although there were construction jobs open at Hanford, there were not permanent jobs open at Hanford. And, and although there was some construction work in the areas around, area businesses, especially businesses in Kennewick, um, but, also, uh, but also other professional jobs were restricted um, from African Americans, right, initially early on. And so, again, this is a system of kind of de facto segregation. There were, there were things that were segregated, like housing, but there were things that were not segregated, like education, right? Blacks and whites went to the same schools in Washington. There was no, there was no segregation there. And so, the civil rights story of the North in many ways is recognizable to the civil rights story we may all be more familiar with in the South, but with interesting wrinkles to it. But nevertheless, civil rights is, is a movement, right? It's a, it's a nationwide problem. It's an America problem, and it's an America movement. And the issues, again, here in Pasco are, a lot of it revolves around housing, especially where people can live and where people feel welcome. And these, um, these pictures actually come from a 1949 report commissioned by the city of Pasco, so showing Pasco's changing attitude, commissioned through Washington State College um, to basically survey attitudes. And these photos also of East Pasco are the only photos that, I, that I've ever found that, that I have not, I've not found any others that exist um, anywhere. And, and the local historical societies have none. I couldn't find any in the newspaper archives. Um, but 
what's interesting is City of Pasco is trying to gauge race, basically attitudes on race relations and trying to understand how it can navigate a, a situation that I think Pasco did not think it would ever be in in 1940, right? By 1950, Pasco is a changed community, right? It is, it is, it is, it is, an, it is a, a community that is now segregated, right? It is, a, it is a forever altered and it's coming to grips with that and how it's going to integrate and support its black residents. And of course, um, with the arrival of African Americans leads to signs, right? And these are well documented and also here, NAACP sent people out to, that documented these kinds of signs in downtown Pasco and Kennewick. And some of you who've, who've been around here for a long time may of course know of the Green Bridge, right? And the famous sundown town sign on the Green Bridge that said that uh, African Americans were not welcome in Kennewick after sundown. And in fact, Kennewick um, uh, was very proud of its status as a lily white community. The, the chief of police of Kennewick said so in a 1964 article. Um, uh, or 1964 newspaper article. And Kennewick was one of the first um, places that, um, that had uh, sustained civil rights marches. But before we get there, I want to hear, I want you to hear from some of the words of people that actually came and lived this, if our audio works, which I hope. And uh, I was working in Los Angeles. And he asked me if I wanted to make some money to come up to Richmond, Washington. Mm -hmm. So I decided to come up here, and I stayed up here for six months. And the dust and the tunnel weeds were so bad, I left, went back to Los Angeles, <laughs> and stayed three months. Okay. And I came back, and I've been here ever since. Okay. Jim, uh, let's talk about uh, the social environment in the Tri-City area. You know, again, Pasco, Kennewick, and Richland for the African American. Uh, at that time, 1948, uh, what was the relationship between the African American and the, uh, we'll say, the uh, the white community or majority community at that time? Bad. Give very, me very prejudiced, very racist. Hmm. And uh, I was surprised when I came here to find a, a place that I had left a few years back from Mississippi and came here and found the same thing that I found in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So that was James Pruitt. Uh, James Pruitt was an early, was a, as he said, came, migrated here in 1948 and stayed. Um, James Pruitt became an active civil rights, um, civil rights warrior, becoming president uh, for some time of the core Congress on Racial Equality, the, the Tri-Cities chapter, as well as one of the first black city employees of Pasco, becoming a liaison between the Pasco Police Department and the East Pasco community, because up until the late 60s, Pasco had, Pasco Police Department had no black police officers. In fact, had no black staff for a city that was almost 20% black. And there had been a lot of racial incidents. Um, a lot of what was, what we know of, of civil rights mirrored in places like Watts, Chicago, Washington, D.C. Those kinds of, of, of tensions were present in the Tri-Cities community. Uh, next we'll hear from Velma Ray. Um, Velma came, or sorry, Virgie Crippen. Virgie Crippen came here in, uh, in the early, in the late 40s um, because she had heard that there was no, there was very little places for African Americans to eat in the area. Um, and so she opened up what, um, what became known as Virgie's Chicken Shack, a very important restaurant in, in East Pasco. Well, that was out of the question. We couldn't even eat, we couldn't even eat at the bus station. We couldn't eat at Payless. We couldn't eat no place uh, in, in downtown Pasco, the, that white owned. And that's the only place they had uh, places to eat that I know about was downtown. How about And clothing? we couldn't go to any of those. How about shopping for clothing oh, or yes. groceries? Oh yes, you could go in all the grocery stores and dress shops and all, and spend your money. And they treat you nice, you know, you're spending your money. So just but you better not go to the bank and ask to borrow some money. You, you could put money in the bank, but you sure couldn't borrow any you know, borrow money. And that's true. Intermountain Mortgage, the main the main mortgage lender in this area, um, had a policy of uh, basically a, a, a covenant um, with local realtors to not lend and not show homes to African Americans. Um, it was would not be until 1965 that that if the first African American lived in Kennewick, and it would not be until. Um, the early 70s where the first African American bought a home in Richland. Um, and so these, these kinds of prejudices did indeed run deep. But again, we're always, 
de facto, or kind of uh, not written into law, but written into practice. Um, <clears throat> next, Alice Barnes uh, talks a bit about work out at Hanford and kind of the segregated nature of work. That it was a prize for a black to work inside a building. You see, if you had a job at Hanford, you were going to be working outside either as a laborer or something like that. But inside as a clerk or something like that, I don't know what the cooks and all those folks experienced, but, but I did hear talk among the men folks about, uh, you know, just simply having a job and getting some overtime and things like that. And I did hear talk, you know, as time went on um, about having a job where you would work inside a building. You know, even as a janitor, you know, that was supposed to be a prized kind of a job for a black man. So Kennewick becomes the first area of sustained civil rights action because of its open hostility towards African Americans, the sign, the, the uh, disallow of any of African Americans to live there. And this photo and the next are from um, a uh, 1963 NAACP march. This march was called by the local and Pacific Northwest chapters of the NAACP, um, and, and uh, the head of the Pacific Northwest chapter of the NAACP um, in 1963 had called Kennewick the Birmingham of Washington. Um, and in fact, he followed that up by saying, in fact, Kennewick is worse than Birmingham because at least blacks can live in Birmingham. Um, so a stinging indictment of, of racial, of exclusionary policies uh, in um, in the area, and this is this photo is uh, also the cover of um, the book that I and a, my fellow, uh, my colleague Bob Bauman wrote about this history: uh, Echoes of Exclusion and Resistance. Sorry, had to get that little plug in there. Um, and ending up, um, by the late 1960s, things have come to a head. Right, um, America is is engulfed in tensions from the Vietnam War, um, civil rights tensions, and those also happened in Pasco. Um, I'm going to skip this clip uh, because it's actually, I realize that they're showing a couple of times, it's a little confusing, but James Pruitt was one of uh, the leaders called in front of the Franklin County Courthouse after um, a traffic stop in East Pasco had resulted in, in a 14-year-old girl being beat um, by Pasco police. Um, and in, in, in response to that, somebody shot at a pass car, uh, Pasco police stepped up enforcement in the East Pasco neighborhood. And then um, a group of protesters, mostly white, actually gathered in front of the Pasco Courthouse, set some of the trees on fire, and overturned a cop car, right? Stuff that is kind of a searing thing from, that, we, that we might expect happening in these larger urban areas. Um, but nevertheless, right, these tensions incredibly present here in Pasco. James Pruitt was one of the people that got up there and said, I will not let this happen again. In fact, he said, as long as there is blood in this body, I will not let this happen again. And after this, Pruitt, was, along with several other African Americans, were hired as black employees in the city of Pasco with the Pasco Police Department, and he became a liaison officer between the community. Um, and so showing that, that Pasco could indeed react to changes, right, react to outside pressure from, from groups, from integrated groups of civil rights efforts. Civil rights story in, in this area is a story of white and black allies, right, working together through nationwide organizations like the NAACP and CORE, but also responding to local concerns, right? Working together um, in order to see some significant improvement. And, and some of those things manifested in the war on poverty legislation, like the, like the Youth Opportunity Program um, being taught by C.J. Mitchell here in the back, uh, another civil rights um, uh, person who uh, just passed away a few years ago, but a very important um, uh, very well known, like Richland resident. Um, some of you may, may know or have met C.J. Mitchell and, or any, uh, some of his kids. Um, another major war on poverty program that forever altered the East Pasco community was urban renewal, right? The buying up of derelict homes um, and redevelopment of poorer communities. And that is indeed what eventually disassoc disassembled East Pasco. Uh, urban, urban renewal came, bought up land, um, supposedly was to give people money to buy better homes outside. It's a program of mixed success in this country. Um, often it was underfunded, um, often uh, and underfunded in the way that the money people got was not always enough to get them a house in the surrounding area. Um, but it did, it did it, its positives, it decreased blight, um, it, it, did, it did achieve a lot of its aims, it did redevelop, increased 
city tax revenue, property taxes. But one negative thing it did, and some of the red people we interviewed um, mentioned this, is that it, it was kind of the official end of the East Pasco community. Um, it did do away with that segregation, right? There was no demarcated line anymore. Um, wherever someone could afford to move is where they could move. No longer was there racially exclusive covenants, right? Kennewick was open, Richland was open, Pasco was open. But it also did away with that kind of close-knit community, right? Um, the, the, the need, the kind of being forced to open your own, your own stores and your own, and your own restaurants out of segregation nevertheless had forged a strong close-knit community that urban renewal dispersed. Um, and, and in that way, um, you know, many of the folks we interviewed had lamented that Pasco kind of, East Pasco lost some of its identity after urban renewal. Um, and, and the community became more scattered, uh, more fragmented. And somewhat sitting incorporated, and I think that's true to an extent, but some might also say scattered too. And that is, that's the end of my presentation. Yeah, Ricky. Uh, nice presentation. Thank uh, you. One quick correction. Uh, the lady who you call Virgie Crippen? Yes. Her name was Virginia Crippen. Virginia Crippen. Crippen. Sorry, it's Virgie's yeah. Chicken Shack. Uh, Virginia's uh, Virginia. Chicken Virginia's Shack. Chicken. Sorry. Thank and you. Sorry, my bad. The first jobs I ever had was I used to cut potatoes for her. But people <laughs> call, yeah, they call them JoJo's now. And she had this machine. Remember that machine she had? And she, would, she would pay me uh, and probably some other kids uh, at that time, going and because she had this machine where we cut the potatoes, you know, into those big chunks, you know, and that and back then that was the only place you could get them. So, but it was Virginia Crippen. Virginia Crippen, thank you. <laughs> so I, um, yeah. I guess more a uh, comment, observation. I think uh, you know, with how you ended about how uh, you know with with the urban renewal that maybe you know you lose the identity. You Passed with the incorporation. I think there might be something. I guess that kind of struck a chord with me having grown up in Pasco in the 80s and 90s. I, I, I believe that that incorporation was, in my view, positive. I think that was kind of almost the baseline of what Pasco pride kind of grew out of in terms of what, if you're from Pasco, and you, you kind of, at least when I was growing up, it kind of was through the veins of everyone else. And so I think there was something that Pasco always had uh, internally, but to the external eye as well, too, is, is being much more welcoming. And so I think sure. there might be something to that. I mean, I, you had Dallas Barnes there. He was my dad's. In 1959, he was a class president of Pasco High School. You know, and a lot of those things are probably more happening in the Northwest, obviously not in the South, but I right. think there was some. some well, and if there's so much more that I just didn't get into on time, but also some of the folks that I interviewed mentioned um, Dr. Fieri, the superintendent of Pasco Schools, who was really involved in trying to bring in black teachers, black and Asian teachers, to kind of diversify the teaching base in the 1960s. Um, and Hanford, to its credit, responding to affirmative action legislation in the 1960s, heavily recruited at HBCUs to really try, and, and the Tri-Cities, it did become a very welcoming place in, 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 in certainly some quarters. Um, where our current oral history project that we're just starting now the, is, is it kind of, it takes where this story kind of ends off in that it's, we were trying to track the Latinx migration into this area and that really starts at the end of the Bracero program at the end of the 1960s and where a lot of Latinx migrants end up moving is East Pasco. Um, and in fact, when I presented this, some of this information uh, to um, a group of students a couple years ago and I had a, a student come out to me and she said, oh, I'm from East Pasco, my parents migrated here in the 19, 1990s and she told me, she said, now I know why my parents always called it Los Barrios de los Negros. And I was like, the, neighbor, the neighborhood of black people? And she was like, yeah. And that's how it had been known. That's how they had talked about it. That community had talked about that. Um, and so it's interesting to me to see how that history kind of gets implanted on informally, right? And kind of carries on even though, even though East Pasco today, there are still some landmarks there. Uh, Kurtzman Park was an important um, partnering of, of uh, Mr. Kurtzman and the African American community to create an outside space. Morning Star Baptist Church is another very important African, uh, African American church landmark there. But so much of East Pasco is, is very different um, 
from today, but nevertheless, its, it's history is, is one of, uh, event, of eventual integration and, and, and a welcoming. And, um, and you know, it's a, a lot of, too, what I heard from people we interviewed was that, you know, their parents, what's interesting, it's the, the generational approach. For a, lot of the, for a lot of the people I interviewed, um, because of when we did it, were children of people that had migrated. And so their parents had moved and had, and had moved here for opportunity and had found a lot of times the financial opportunity to, to and, you know, needed to leave the South, right? And, but for the children, they felt a civil rights calling in order to say, we've got the opportunity, but now we want the equality. Um, and so that was a lot of the work of the NAACP and CORE and those groups was to kind of, you know, as MLK said, right, America, you know, owes, owes a debt, right? There's a, there's a check waiting to be cashed. And that was the, the cashing of that check or the, you know, trying to cash that check. Anyway, um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, echoes of exclusion and resistance. Voices from the Hanford region. And Scott, we have a chat, three chapters on African American history, a chapter on the Wanapum, and then uh, we also interviewed the Yamauchi family who were um, affected by the Japanese internment. They lived in Benton and Franklin County. And because the river was the dividing line, those that lived in Benton County were interned, those that live in Franklin County were not interred. Which, if that sounds arbitrary, it's because our internment was deeply illogical. <laughs> and, and wrong. One, one quick comment. Yeah. Yeah, to, dis to disenfranchise. Yeah, and, that, and, and so we have to understand that that transition didn't happen peacefully. Oh. By the time we came into the 1950s, because they were recruited from Mexico from Texas, the Mole here, because of the irrigation project that made this great, wonderful area for agriculture. And so a lot, a lot of people came out of here. And then again, we, were, we weren't even allowed to buy property. Yeah. So, but we have to understand everything happened and it happened peacefully. It just happened to society, but people of color were powerless to pit it against each other. And so I hope that as we come forward to that, that we also bring that reality that we experienced. Heard. Thank you. I'm going to wrap this up. Okay.